Hey, everyone. It's a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, striking up the live stream. So let's do it. Here we go. Just got home. Just sat down. No preparation as usual. But here you go. Here is college football live for a Thursday via Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. What a show we have planned for you. We've got Steve Hellwagon standing by from Bucknuts. He will join us in just a minute. Claire Crawford to talk Ohio State football as well. Savannah Lee Richardson from Bulldog Illustrated to set us up for the largest cocktail party in America. Of course, that's uh, Georgia and Florida, and we're not supposed to refer to it as that anymore, but that's okay. And also George Reister. Let's talk some Ohio State football, though, right out of the gate. Uh, and in between our guests, we invite you to call the call in line at 860-325-3687. I will put the number in the live chat. But uh, without further ado, got Steve Hellwagon on the line to talk Ohio State football from Bucknuts. Uh, Steve, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good. What's going on, Mark? What is going on? Well, not uh, a, a very quiet night compared to what was going on, let's say, about four nights ago in West yeah. Lafayette real struggle for the Buckeyes out there at West Lafayette, obviously. And, uh, got to tell you, it was, um, uh, interesting. We knew the weather was going to maybe play a part in the game. We're driving through Lafayette, then cross the river into West Lafayette. And there are limbs and trees and power lines down everywhere because, uh, the winds were kicking up into the forties and we parked a mile away, got on a golf cart they had rigged for us to take us to the game through the golf course there. And there was a tree that had been knocked over. And we asked the person driving the golf cart, uh, well, how long did that happen? And the man said, oh, about a half hour ago. So, yeah, we were – it was kind of like Armageddon over there. It was like – it was like uh, – I think the game time temperature was 38 and the winds were gusting anywhere 20 to 30 miles per hour and uh, kind of a tough uh, place to play, but it didn't seem to impact the offenses. They combined to throw for almost 800 yards, I think, between uh, David Blau and uh, uh, Dwayne Haskins for Ohio State. But uh, if you were an Ohio State fan, it was a rough, tough game to watch, no doubt about it. We get Steve Hellwagon on the line from Bucknuts. Please join him right there. He is also a Big Ten senior writer for 247 Sports. Ohio State going down to Purdue 49 to 20. And the Buckeyes took quite a, um, a drop down in the AP and coaches polls from 2 to 11. And we will see soon what the College Football Playoff Selection Committee has to say. So, Steve, let's, uh, let's try to dissect this one. Uh, 73 passes for an Ohio State offense. This was not you know, uh, Texas Tech or Washington State under Mike Leach or some other uh, high-powered offense that had to live and die by throwing the ball downfield. This is just alarming to see. And, of course, it was all uh, driven in the fourth quarter by the score of the game, so you have to throw at that point on every play. But even before that, this has become such a pass-heavy, reliant offense. Yeah, no question about it. You think about uh, the last five games, uh, they have now been under four yards per carry in each of the last five games, which is just unbelievable. Uh, I think uh, one of the national guys put out a stat that that had only happened five times in the first six years. Urban Meyer was the head coach at Ohio State. Now it's happened five games in a row. So they got some major issues in terms of running the football right now. And uh, obviously this is an open week for them. They're back at it November the 3rd against, uh, uh, Nebraska. So, uh, when, when they get to that point, I guess maybe we'll have a better idea if they put this time to good use or not, but, uh, teams have been sitting on them at the line of scrimmage and, uh, making Dwayne Haskins throw the ball. And he does not necessarily throw the ball up the field all that much. He throws it a lot, but a lot of it's underneath stuff. So, uh, you know, I guess when uh, uh, they get back to action, we'll have a, a better idea, I suppose, of, uh, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen here down the stretch for Ohio State. But with each passing week, it's become harder and harder for Ohio State to establish the run. 
And that just seems unthinkable uh, when you look at uh, everything Ohio State's been able to do with decent balance here in recent years. Now it is skewed almost entirely uh, to the passing game and and teams uh, have found a way to beat Ohio State. Uh, even when uh, Haskins throws for 470 yards, a school record. We've got uh, Steve Hellwagen on the line from Bucknuts, breaking down Ohio State football. The Buckeyes, of course, coming off that uh, thrashing at Purdue, 49-20. to 20. Uh, The last time Purdue beat a number two ranked team, of course, Ohio State uh, in 1984. That team went to the Rose Bowl, and Purdue had Jim Everett at quarterback. And I'm sure, Steve, you remember that to a certain extent. I know that I did as soon as I saw that uh, factoid during the game? Yeah, no question about it. Uh, Ohio State was able to overcome that, still win the Big Ten Championship that season, and uh, got the nod to go to the Rose Bowl after that 1984 season. Um, lost USC in the Rose Bowl, but still won the big, at least to share the Big Ten Championship. Um, <clears throat> as you look at this race right now, uh, the win by Purdue has obviously catapulted Purdue into this position where they are among four teams tied with one loss in the Western Division, Iowa, Northwestern, uh, Wisconsin, and Purdue. Got somewhat of a of, a, of an elimination game this week, Wisconsin uh, playing Northwestern uh, this coming weekend, and uh, we'll see uh, what comes out of that. Uh, you know, uh, both those teams, their only Big Ten loss was to Michigan. Uh, Purdue's loss was to Northwestern. Iowa's loss was to Wisconsin. So, uh, obviously, they'll all play each other before the season ends, and a lot will be shaken out. It's anybody's guess right now uh, who could win this because all four of those teams really, uh, with the exception, I'd say, of Wisconsin coming off that thrashing at the hands of Miss Michigan are playing good football right now. It's just going to be a question who can uh, put it all together here down the stretch. Uh, Northwestern uh, obviously outlasted Nebraska, and, and uh, I think uh, they, they may have played Rutgers this past week, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, it, it's been a little bit of a struggle for them perhaps the last couple of weeks, but they found ways to win games. I'm interested. I mean, we got some really good games this weekend. We're talking about uh, Iowa at Penn State. That's important uh, for Iowa because it counts in the standings, even though it's a crossover game. Then, as we talked about, Northwestern, uh, Wisconsin is at Northwestern. Uh, that's going to be a, a good one as well. So, uh, you know, there are some games uh, that are worth watching. And, of course, Purdue also at Michigan State. And here Michigan State has now got – a uh, second Big Ten loss, so they're kind of desperate as well at this point. Although in my mind, you know, with it down to four games left for Ohio State and Michigan, seems like they will probably settle that one on the field uh, between themselves uh, if Ohio State's able to get past Michigan State uh, in East Lansing in a couple of weeks. The winner of the Ohio State-Michigan game seems like they will be uh, the team that represents the East. That seems to be the one uh, fly in the ointment that's still out there is if Ohio State can win that game at Michigan State. And obviously the other games, Nebraska at home, Maryland on the road, uh, could come down to that last week with Ohio State and Michigan. And very fitting if uh, that is a play-in game uh, for the Eastern uh, Division. Uh, finally, those two teams meeting with the division championship on the line. Ohio State already had it clinched uh, last year when they played in Ann Arbor. So, uh, And if Ohio State loses to Michigan State and gets a second Big Ten loss and Michigan keeps a winning mark, it's very, very – it would be a possibility Michigan would have it clinched before they have to come down and play Ohio State. And at that point, they'd be just playing to stay in the – to obviously finish the regular season and stay in the playoff hunt at that point. So uh, a lot of football left to be played. It's a lot of speculation right now over who's going to uh, fit in where. But uh, for Ohio State, uh, practicing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week, they gave the guys off Sunday and Monday. Uh, they will be off uh, Friday and Saturday, although they'll probably be some type of a physical workout for the guys on Friday. Uh, but they'll be off Friday and Saturday. No, no practice per se. Coaches will be out recruiting at high school games this weekend. And then Sunday, they'll be back at work for a normal work week, getting ready uh, to return to action on November the 3rd against Nebraska. I like you, Steve. I'm a bit fascinated by the Western Division race. The East gets all the hype. It's anybody's race at this point. Everybody thought it'd be Wisconsin in a cakewalk, and that hasn't materialized. But, uh, 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, in Wisconsin disadvantaged by those crossover games, having to play uh, Michigan and Penn State both. That's kind of a, a rough way to go. And we've discussed it in the past. You either um, can take advantage or you have the disadvantage there. And in the past, uh, including especially last year, uh, Wisconsin had a pretty favorable non-division schedule. But this year, as you mentioned, they've got to play two of the heavyweights um, and both of them on the road. And uh, Iowa seemed to be the one team that could possibly challenge Wisconsin. And we thought that they would have to win that head-to-head matchup at Kinnick Stadium. But with Wisconsin struggling elsewhere, still facing a Penn State team on the road, uh, it's incredible to me that uh, Purdue, in losing its first three games, obviously only one of those in the Big Ten. But it's just the the look of an 0-3 team then four weeks later challenging for an SEC or for a uh, Big Ten Western Division championship is uh is interesting theater for me. Um, and you know what's uh, what, yes, what, sir. What's, what's even crazier about it, Mark, is that they've got Wisconsin and Iowa still to come to their place. So I mean, that's just nuts. Uh, Purdue has got all the advantages. They could be coming down to the end of the season, uh, playing their rivalry game against Indiana uh, with something really on on the line. Uh, if not a bowl bid, then uh, perhaps maybe the division. Uh, a share of the division championship and a thought that maybe they would be uh, win some tiebreaker to go to Indianapolis. So uh, very complicated um, situation, but uh, at least we're going to have some quality games, I think on the field to help settle it. Well, Steve, we're all used to uh, in sports in general, overreaction after the game. So leading up into this Purdue game, a lot of people on the national stage, especially ignored Ohio State's flaws. Uh, You knew what they were. I knew what they were. They were fairly obvious, but it was, well, Ohio State and Alabama are going to play. They're both undefeated. They're going to clean the slate, and they'll be showing up in the college football playoff, those two for sure, and probably Clemson. Um, That was the thought by many. And then they lose one game, and I know it was ugly, 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 but they lost one game, and I'm seeing things where can Ohio State possibly get back into the college football playoff talk? Well, they lost one game. If they win the Big Ten championship, uh, and I understand there's a difference between in the argument of is this team good enough to run the table and erase that loss and win the – but the mathematics I don't agree with. If, if this team wins the Big Ten championship and it only has one loss – Yes, there could be an issue if they have to face off against the Big 12 in the college football playoff selection committee's eyes if the other three, meaning Clemson, Notre Dame, and uh, Alabama, let's say, are undefeated, that that's, uh, there could be a, uh, a TCU, Baylor, Ohio State kind of situation with the Big 12 this year. But uh, it's just amazing the, how they have fallen from, from grace and from favor nationally. Yeah, I think it's not so simple to say that if they win out, they're in at 12-1. and one. And, and I think, first of all, they're going to need to play better. They're going to need to not slough through uh, and, uh, you know, maybe squeak by some of these games. They're going to need to play a, a strong game here. Nebraska put up 600 yards total offense this past week in winning their game. They're going to play Bethune-Cookman this week and probably continue to hone what they're doing. They'll come in at two and two and six, I believe, when they come to Columbus. And the situation for them is very simple, another loss, and they are out of contention for a bowl game. So just like we saw with Purdue, they're going to throw caution to the wind and Ohio State better be prepared for that. Ohio State had had no inclination that uh, that Purdue was going to pull out all the stops like they did with that fake field goal. Uh, a middle school coach would have told you there, do not rush the field goal. Make sure they kick the ball. Uh, it's four days later. I am still – 24 years I've covered Ohio State. That may be the stupidest play I've seen out of Ohio State. And and for a number of reasons, they had been outplayed six ways till Tuesday in that first half, and yet they got a defensive stop at the 15-yard line. I think it was they were at the 13-yard line. It was fourth and four or fourth and three. And – Purdue was going to kick the field goal to go up 10-3 at halftime. 
and it was almost like a relief. It was almost like Ohio State uh, got the ball to start the second half had they held them to a field goal there, or in hindsight, had the rusher stayed home and tackled the holder who was trying to run for the first down, they potentially can take the lead on the first series of the second half. Instead, they allowed the holder to break contain, as I say again, one of the stupidest plays I've seen in 24 years. How many 30-yard field goals get blocked in the course of the year? Maybe, I don't know if they kick it in the line, maybe two. I don't know. Because when they kick a a 30-yard field goal, the ball goes straight up in the air. There wasn't anybody going to get to that football. I, I Show me all the field goals you blocked. It's just like they roughed the punter later on. Show me all the punts you blocked. Just they were a victim of their own arrogance and stupidity this past week is what it seems to me. Uh, they didn't take Purdue seriously, just like they didn't take Iowa seriously the year before. You'd think that they'd learn these lessons at some point. Now, this was their eighth game in eight weeks, so there's something to be said for that. Purdue had had a week off the the week prior and then had basically a cakewalk against Illinois on the road, a short road trip and a, like a 46 to seven win. So they weren't extended all that difficult in two weeks prior. They were home rested and ready for Ohio state, which didn't answer the challenge. But at any rate, I I'm sure I've digressed from whatever it was that started this discussion, but, um, you know, the whole idea that Ohio State is still in some kind of a position uh, for the playoff, they need to win out, look good doing it. And I think it started with Nebraska. Will they take Nebraska seriously or not? Well, Nebraska's back playing good football. So they better take them seriously, even though the game's at home. Uh, you know, they need they need to win out, look good doing it, and they do need help, as you said. And I'm not even sure. I think Alabama's same scenario as last year. They could lose to LSU. I doubt they would lose to Auburn. But at, uh, but if something were to happen and they lost the game and didn't go to the SEC championship game, they should still be in the uh, the uh, the playoff just as they were last year. And perhaps that puts two SEC teams in there again. I, I don't think anybody's beating Alabama. Just throw it out there. I don't think that they can have a second team if Alabama goes on and wins the SEC championship because I think they'd all have two losses at that point, whoever it would be. So I I doubt that that scenario would play out. I think Clemson is more than likely going to continue to run the table in the ACC. But again, even with one loss, they could still win the ACC with one loss. Uh, Notre Dame, it depends if, if they lose, it depends who they lose to. Uh, they play Navy in San Diego this week. Doesn't seem like it's a game that Notre Dame would lose. I know they play USC later in the season. USC is just kind of floundering a little over 500 right now, up one, down one. Maybe they pluck them off at the end of the season. It's hard to say. But you think about it, it's just going to be kind of a case where uh, – they do need help. Texas and Oklahoma, uh, the winner of their game obviously was Texas. Does Texas go on and win the Big 12? Does Texas win the Big 12 with one loss? Uh, does Oklahoma win the Big 12 with one loss? Does West Virginia win the Big 12 with one loss? That's still going to sort itself out. And uh, is that team going to be ahead of Ohio State uh, or you know, M- Michigan with one loss, which – uh, Michigan continues to run the table that they're in. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, their one loss would be to Notre Dame, which would theoretically be a playoff team. So I think we're interested to see which direction it goes. So they might need help. We don't know if they need help, but certainly that situation leads itself to possibly needing help because we Ohio State fans would not want them to win the Big Ten title with one loss at 12-1 and one and have to go up in a selection against Oklahoma or Texas as a 12-1 and one Big 12 winner that most likely, and especially in Oklahoma's case, they would have avenged the one loss that they had to Texas, and that was only yep. – field goal at the gun against a 12 and one football team or an 11 and one football team at the time. So that obviously looks much better. And as you mentioned, as strictly a big 10 observer for somebody just rooting for the big 10 to make the playoff, Michigan is the team to root for because they would have by far the most uh, understandable loss on the road against Notre Dame by a touchdown. And if you believe in, uh, the game's meaning more as you get closer to November. That game was obviously way, 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 way back there. 
So yep. two things, Steve, uh, make no mistake about it. You can ramble on about anything you'd like. I have you on here to talk Ohio State football. So regardless yeah. of what my question is, you have free reign to talk about whatever you want, whatever okay. comes Number two, I thought it was a great point. We pointed out um, that's a big statement coming from you that carries a lot of weight. When you say in 24 years of covering Ohio State football, that was just about the stupidest lack of preparation for a situation, knowing that you have to be ready for fake field goals, especially when you're playing an underdog. Yeah. Well, they lose the game 49 to 20, which is basically seven touchdowns to three. Let's let's review this. One of them was the fake field goal that became a touchdown. One of them was roughing the punter that ultimately became a touchdown. One of them was roughing the passer which on third down, which ultimately became a touchdown. That's three right there. And finally, Dwayne Haskins threw a pick six in desperation at the end of the game when they're just wheeling it out there, hoping for anything of any kind of hope. So basically, Ohio State took that game and gift wrapped it and handed it to Purdue. Purdue was the tougher team. Purdue on that night was the better team, no doubt about it. I'm just pointing out, that for everything that for as bad as we think this game was, it was silly mistakes one after another after another, a lot several of them on special teams that cost Ohio State the game. Their defense got stops and then was sent back out there again to try and get another stop. And that's probably one of the most difficult things to do in football, particularly when they fake a field goal and now it's first and goal at the nine yard line. <laughs> That makes it really difficult. They scored on the very next play and uh, went up 11 at halftime, and now it's a, a two-score game, basically. And Ohio State could not manage a touchdown to start the second half. They got a field goal, and uh, then Purdue just always had that two-touchdown lead uh, from that point on, basically, uh, when they went down and scored again. So, yeah, it just uh, was just kind of a, a runaway uh, snowball or a freight train in terms of the Boilermakers, I guess. And uh, we heard that uh, that train uh, horn a number of times there Saturday night uh, at Purdue. At least seven. And, and they celebrated, uh, you know, they beat the number two team on paper in the country. And uh, those people came onto the field from every direction. And, you know, good good for them. Purdue's been through a lot of lean years in the last five or six years. And, uh, you know, fun thing for them to have that kind of a thing. And now we'll see if they can sustain it going forward. As we said, at Michigan State this week, home games with uh, Wisconsin and Iowa and then I think at Indiana at the end of the season, uh, they have another game in there somewhere. I'm not sure where it is, but I'm not, I don't believe it's one of the top teams. So, uh, yeah, it's it'll be an interesting road for them. It's arguably been the worst program in the Big Ten since about 2008, 2009, because even you could say, well, Any hope. Finish, yeah. finishing up a Rose Bowl run in 07, then they got pretty bad for a long time, and it pretty much sustained that. And if you take out Rutgers and Maryland, uh, during that entire time that uh, there were Big Ten teams in play, Purdue would be in the running for the worst program because they've been abysmal for the most part during that stretch, maybe made a bowl game or two and got obliterated. I know by Oklahoma State about five years ago uh, by like 40 points. They, they've been awful, but Jeff Brom, wow, the job that he's done to not only match the defense of Nick Holt, but also, um, yes, Taylor, the offense, we knew that he would bring the offense with him eventually. They actually won on defense last year and got to a bowl game and won seven games, mostly on defense. They lose the nine starters on defense, and then he coaches up the offense. And uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts about David Blau now that you've seen him in person, because it's ironic to me that he was considered the running quarterback and Elisha Sindelar, the passing quarterback. And man, he's making NFL throws and he's just tearing everybody up. Yeah, 578 yards. He threw four against Missouri in a loss. Uh, he was well over, I think, 350 against Illinois the game before Ohio State uh, in the high 300s against Ohio State as well. And a lot of teams have thrown the ball effectively against Ohio State with big chunk plays. But when you have an athlete, the quality of Rondale Moore, the freshman who's highly acclaimed out there, I think his numbers 
for 12 catches for 170 yards and a couple of touchdowns. The running back, Knox, was also over 100 yards and had three touchdowns. Uh, he broke uh, loose for a long touchdown at the end of the game. And Moore, also in probably a microcosm of the entire game, caught a pass near the left sideline. And one of Ohio State's safeties prior just basically tried to take him and fling him to the ground. And it didn't work because Rondell Moore somehow kept his – balance and kept his feet churning and then got it back up to full speed again and was gone on just an amazing touchdown. So uh, they've got some playmakers uh, in addition to Rondell Moore and Knox, the running back. They've got a couple other guys who are also uh, pretty good players as well. So uh, they are playing uh, by far their best football right now. Obviously uh, won four games in a row and are starting to really hit their stride on what they can do. Could have won the Missouri game. Uh, obviously could have won the Eastern Michigan game, could have won the Northwestern game. I mean, at the beginning, 31-27, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I think was the final score there, or 41-37, well, I think may have been it, whatever it was, it was a four, I think it was a four-point game. Uh, the Missouri and, game? Uh, the Northwestern game, the first game yeah, of the year. Missouri was a, they lost Missouri was a field three. goal. I think it was 34-32. Yeah. That could be – and Missouri was a, yeah, a three-point game, two, three-point game as well. So uh, they've been in every game that they played, uh, haven't been blown out, and uh, going to get a chance against the upper echelon with Wisconsin and Iowa to show what they can do. They're both ranked teams now. Iowa's taken their rightful place down there about 14, 15, 16 in the polls, and they're just kind of lurking right now. Uh, they lost that game to Wisconsin. It was virtually a standoff. Uh, for 60 minutes when they played Wisconsin and Wisconsin broke through uh, at the end and had that touchdown and then tacked on a long run after that. But uh, yeah, it um, to me, I think the West has turned out to be uh, a fascinating race and uh, Michigan State and Penn State haven't necessarily lived up to the preseason hype uh, and yet very dangerous. I mean, Penn State can beat Iowa this week. Michigan State can beat Ohio State and East Lansing in a couple of weeks and they throw a wrench into this whole thing, uh, Michigan could be the beneficiary of all this uh, down the stretch. Steve Hellwagon joining us from Bucknuts. Uh, join him at uh, the 247 site there for um, Ohio State football. He's also a senior Big Ten writer there at 247 Sports. Steve, uh, one quick comment, then I'm going to ask you one more question. We'll let you go okay. to all the time you've given us. Uh, yeah, Rondale Moore, uh, if anybody just caught up with him on Saturday night, uh, he's been catching passes like this since week one against Northwestern. He's only a freshman. They showed the clip where he picked up the Ohio State hat when he was uh, making his announcement on National Signing Day, and then he dropped it for the Purdue hat. He comes from uh, Jeff Brahms High School. And what's amazing about him, Steve, as you well know, is that in addition, when you Throughout football history, when we see a guy that quick and small in five seven or five eight, we we think of him in the you know Dante Hall, Eric Metcalf mold that they're they're just quick. This kid squats six hundred pounds. He's yeah, he's a he's a he's a crazy athlete. There's no two ways about it. And uh, I think if you have any doubts about what he can do on the football field, just pop in the tape of or DVR of that game and you will see that uh, he can impact the game in a ton of different ways. Also had a few yards rushing as well out of the backfield and some sets and uh, in the return game. He had a nice return or two as well in the game and uh, maybe 50 yards in returns. So there's a lot of things. I think his all-purpose yardage was around 250, I believe, when you factored in maybe 30 rushing, 50 in uh, uh, returns and then 170 or whatever it was in uh, uh, receiving. So he can do a lot of things, and he's only scratching the surface of what he's going to do. Uh, he and Brom are making some amazing music together right now. I think that is an intriguing matchup, them going on the road to play at Michigan State. Uh, Michigan State's defense has typically been pretty good. I know they've, they've given up a few plays this year here and there, but uh, I think that'll be a tremendous test. And, uh, you know, my thought, uh, you were asking about Blau earlier. Um, I think Ohio State, uh, not having Nick Bosa, obviously, defensive end, he's been gone since the TCU game and is not coming back, obviously, now, uh, regardless of his recovery uh, from the core muscle surgery. I think it was 
probably a less than 50% chance, even if he'd gotten healthy that, or that, uh, or that he would have gotten healthy in time to help them, I guess is the point that I was trying to make. Uh, maybe by the bowl game, he would have been back, but I think it's, again, uh, their pass rush has really suffered without him. I think they only got to uh, plow twice in the course of the game uh, this past week. And once he settled down, he had some happy feet and was throwing the ball kind of high and wide early. But once they kind of got him calmed down and got him centered, uh, he played a fabulous game. After about the first quarter, he played really well. And uh, Ohio State's pass rush, again, all the issues that they're having in the secondary, perhaps even with the linebackers, I think it begins with the fact that other than Draymond Jones and maybe Chase Young, who had the huge game against Penn State but really hasn't been heard from Indiana, Minnesota, and now Purdue, uh, they got some real pass rush issues. And I don't know if it's something that they can solve uh, by bringing blitz pressure uh, running stunts and twists up front. Uh, Draymond Jones is tremendous, but when he gets double teamed, as he as he has been, uh, there's very little he can do. Robert Landers has been uh, in and out of the lineup, one of their top defensive tackles as well. They're hoping maybe this will get him healthy. Uh, Jonathan Cooper kind of sparks a play every now and then at defensive end. Uh, Malik Harrison at uh, linebacker had 10 tackles and a half sack. But again, uh, as Greg Schiano said, 20 missed tackles. Uh, we got a chance to talk to Schiano today as well as uh, – the offensive coordinator uh, Day, Brian Day, and Shiano said maybe in a normal game you'll have four or five missed tackles against Purdue. They had 20 missed tackles. So that'll tell you what uh, was kind of a foot for the Buckeyes uh, in that game against Purdue. So in this day and age, Steve, it's not difficult to imagine even a top-tier team like Ohio State with all the talent in the world maybe struggling in pass defense. That seems to be if you have one struggle on a team that's a top-notch team because these teams have become so adept at throwing the football, catching the ball. The receivers are so freakish these days, and the quarterbacks have been trained from the time they were 10 years old going to all these camps that the, the development has been so quick that if we see teams struggle in pass defense all over the place. So that one isn't as alarming to me, at least as run blocking, running game not being what it, we would expect it to be with the one elite back and one really good back and Mike Weber in the backfield and the offensive line being generally experienced and four and five star guys and then the the defense also getting gashed in the run game all of that it's not one thing it's all those things and from a coaching staff that's kind of an all-star coaching staff yeah, it's a bit puzzling I think the running game is something they're deconstructing and trying to put back together. Uh, they don't seem to run outside a whole heck of a lot. Everything seems to be between the tackles. Uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, there's no threat of the quarterback running the ball. So in past years where uh, if Barrett didn't like what he was going to see giving the ball to Dobbins, he could uh, keep the ball himself and get yardage. Haskins seems to be uh, loath to do that. So <clears throat> I think that's part of it. Uh, I think uh, your offensive line perhaps wears down. They played 100 plays this past week, which is amazing. Uh, so maybe that's part of it. Uh, maybe they need an upgrade or two on the offensive line. I think that, uh, again, you would it's counterintuitive to think that you're throwing for 400 yards. That should open some things up in terms of the running game, but it's actually been the opposite because Haskins, as I said earlier, does not look to throw the ball that far down the field. A lot of his stuff is crossing routes underneath where you can sneak that seventh guy up closer to the line of scrimmage and not worry so much. They're going to beat you over the top because maybe they do complete one or two of those now and then, but it hasn't been how they've done most of their damage. So I think the run game, they've got to come up with a way against a loaded box and no blocking back. Uh, I suggested, or I wouldn't say suggested, I asked Ryan Day today that in the year before he arrived, Weber was very effective blocking for Curtis Samuel in two back sets. Now, nobody wants to block. I understand that. But is that something that they could use five, ten times a game to have both those guys on the field together, one blocking for the other one at the point of attack? And maybe that helps clear out enough that they can get to the second level. They're not even getting to the second level. I mean, a four-yard gain at this point 
is hallelujah, I think, for them. So uh, I don't know what else to say about that. On the other side, what I think about defensively, I think about a, a term that I've come to use called the churn. And when you send three underclassmen to the NFL every year, as they have with Conley and Lattimore and, you know, all these guys in recent years, and then this past year, Hubbard, Denzel Ward, Jerome Baker, gone, Nick Bosa, essentially the same as having not played at all. He played two and a half games, also gone. That's four starters off last year's team that could be on this year's team that aren't there. Eventually, after four or five years, it's my experience, three, four, five years of that, as I say, that churn, that that whole thing there where you're churning the butter or whatever, uh, it catches up with you. And uh, I think that they are having a hard and very difficult time uh, filling those spots with top defensive players. And uh, this is what you're left with. This is what it looks like after all the stars have left finally for the NFL. Now, the good news is if everyone's patient next year, they could have as many as 13 or 14 guys on the defense who were national top 100 picks. And they would be sophomores and juniors at that point. A lot of them are playing this year, like Pryor, uh, Baron Browning a little bit, uh, some of these other guys. But at least, uh, well, certainly the two defensive backs, Okuda and Wade, would fit in there. Uh, Tyreek Johnson is a true freshman this year who was regarded as heavily as those guys. So the star power may be back next year with a little bit of experience and also some some hardly earned and uh, learned lessons, let's just say, of uh, how tough it is to play in the Big Ten. That's kind of my feeling is that that eventually after you've had this type of attrition, year after year after year and guys only starting for a couple of years and then going to the NFL. I mean, they had Marshawn Lattimore started one year and was gone. Uh, Malik Hooker started one year and was gone. I mean, you might replace them for a while, but to be able to keep doing that and sustain that year after year after year, very difficult in my opinion. So I think that some of that's come home to roost. There's no, there's no special difference maker on this defense. Nick Bosa was it. Draymond Jones, to a degree, can be it. He he can he can probably be carried, but he can't carry, and that is just the fact of life, I guess. Uh, the other guys are, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not honestly not sure. Some of the guys who are starting now will still be starting a year from now. That's because I think as some of those young guys who have the pedigree as a national top 50 prospect get their feet under them, learn what they're doing at the college level, they'll take over. That's kind of been my experience as well, that, that it's hard to keep guys who have that pedigree off. They've also had some guys who didn't pan out. Justin Hilliard, Deshaun Cornell, Keandre Jones, they were all national top 100 players, and they're not playing. If they are playing, they're playing as backups and special teams guys. Dante Booker, same thing. So there's four guys right there who didn't pan out uh, as top 100 guys uh, typically. That uh, So, you know, long story short, it's caught up with them this year. That's what's basically happened. And they haven't played well defensively in eight games. And uh, they got a week here to get it figured out, and get those guys some reps, work on them in the film room. And, and, you know, they keep falling for the same things week after week after week after week, giving up big chunk plays. And eventually uh, you either get better or you get left behind. And they're on the verge of getting left behind for a Citrus Bowl. You know, they've played in a major bowl game every year. When they've gone to a bowl, other than the Fickle year in 2011, they went to the Gator Bowl. Ooh. The following year, they were on probation and did have a bowl. Yeah, every year. Every year they go to a major bowl game. Uh, they've been in what you'd call the New Year's Six every year, all the way back with trust. Oh, cool. all the, all, oh, 04, Alamo oh, Bowl in 04. Yeah. Every year but those two, the year that they were in the Gator Bowl and the year that uh, they were on probation, they didn't go to a bowl game. But they have been in one of the top four or top six bowl games from 2005, uh, 13-year span. Uh, it would be 11 of those 13 years they've been in a major bowl game. And to be very honest with you, that is in some doubt. If uh, they lose to Michigan State, lose to Michigan, and now you're sitting there at 9-3 and three and you don't go play for the Big Ten Championship, you're probably going to Orlando. You're probably going to the Citrus Bowl or Tampa to the Outback Bowl, which is almost unheard of for Ohio State at this point, like we said. So um, I guess uh, 
they got a lot to play for here in the last month. We'll see if they put the pieces together here this week. Steve, I should have mentioned this out of the gate. Uh, you don't have to make a long statement on this, but really the, the most up-to-date storyline concerning all this is some combination of um, tension in the athletic administration between Gene Smith and Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer's health, is Urban Meyer going to come back? Were the issues with Zach Smith kind of a carryover in terms of tension and, and all those things? There's There's a lot brewing there. What do you think is is real or perceived? there yeah i saw the football scoop uh, report as well there were no sources that were mentioned and uh, i don't want to dispute or debunk what they said it seemed to indicate that urban meyer was sore at the people above him which is the president drake and the athletic director gene smith uh he was asked about it on the teleconference yesterday says that he and gene smith work closely together talk darn near every day about whatever's going on i think that uh meyer has uh it, you know, it's one thing to be the emperor of everything that you see, which he certainly is. But at the same time, uh, the emperor still needs to procure things <laughs> through the proper channels. And I think that's how his relationship with Gene Smith has evolved over the years, that he sees him as a resource man for what he wants done. And uh, basically, uh, they've given him everything that he wants to get things done, including salaries for assistant coaches. Gene Smith has helped him get everything he wants. And I think that's what Meyer's appreciation level seems to me to be with Gene Smith. Uh, he could be upset with Drake about having to sit out the three games still. That could be a lingering resentment until the day one of them leaves the university. I don't know. Uh, regarding uh, internally, I think it's just the normal push-pull of what happens uh, behind closed doors. Uh, and honestly, there was even uh, some barking going back and forth that appeared between Shiano and Meyer on the sideline, I think during the Minnesota game, uh, when some things were kind of going sideways. So uh, I think it's just part of the normal progression of things. And I think that uh, uh, just the way that uh, way, way things happen, as they said, it's one thing to you know yell and scream at each other. The important thing is getting back down to work and getting it fixed. So that's what they're working on this week. <clears throat> Steve Hellwagen joining us from 247 Sports. Uh, join him right there at Bucknuts for the best in Ohio State football coverage. Steve, we appreciate uh, all the time that you gave us tonight. Uh, thank you so much for that. And certainly, um, yeah, Ohio State, Nebraska, Buckeye fans can take the week off and uh, lick their wounds, maybe enjoy some other college football before we get worried about uh, Nebraska coming up. Thanks so much, Steve. All right, Mark. Take care. Steve Hellwag and Buck Nuts uh, doing a tremendous job by uh, covering Ohio State football. Uh, join them right there at 247 Sports Platform for Ohio State football. We also will have Claire Crawford on the line a little bit later talking the Buckeyes. Also, Savannah Lee Richardson from Bulldog Illustrated helping us set up Georgia, Florida. Huge game in the SEC Eastern Division. Of course, both teams with one loss. George Reister, the Unafraid Show. Uh, said to join us as well as Kevin McGuffey from Last Word on College Football as the Kentucky Wildcats continue into November, close to November, with just one loss in Kentucky, Florida, and Georgia right now vying for the SEC Eastern Division Championship. And who knows who else will stop by. We've got the phone lines open at 860-325-3687. All right. Um, Hey, let's take a phone call right here. Oh boy, we, we have some set difficulties. Hang on. All right, we'll get it together here. It's Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Mark, this is your longtime nemesis, Clemson alum 98. Clemson alum 98, longtime nemesis. Uh, I guess we're talking about uh, Ohio State's less than stellar play against Clemson. Well, I think we've all seen the truth on Clemson these last couple games. We've outscored our last two opponents 104 or 5 or 6. I've lost count to 10. And those 10 points were against third team defenders. I mean, we're red shirting five stars. I'm feeling good. I think I think we got it this year. We're going to win it all. 
So I predicted Clemson to win the national championship this year. So that would be okay with me. I always like to get predictions correct. Uh, yeah, it didn't look, uh, it looked fine for the ACC, but not for the um, college football playoff um, advancement early in the season with the, the offense struggling. And of course the Kelly Bryant situation, but Trevor Lawrence, while many of us um, questioned the situation there in rushing Lawrence into play that quickly and not, keeping both quarterbacks in play because you have to admit that once Lawrence went down uh, momentarily against Syracuse and you barely pulled that game out with uh, Chase Bryce uh, throwing the football downfield, that there was some thought that maybe Dabo misstepped here, not keeping both quarterbacks in play. I think that's true. And I think the logic was the logic was that if they waited too late into the season, he wouldn't have enough developmental time. And when he faced potentially lethal defenses in the playoff, you know, you don't, you don't want that learning curve occurring at that time. So I think what we have now is we have maybe eight games of steady development. And then hopefully he has the uh, football knowledge and the acuity and the, and the fast thinking that's going to be required to play these lethal defenses in the playoff. Otherwise, Otherwise, if it, if it was a if it was a Trevor Lawrence starting in game three or four in the playoff, I'd be very concerned. But I think a Trevor Lawrence starting in game ten or eleven in the playoff is much more viable. So maybe we got a little bit lucky in that that was handled a little bit sloppy, and and we got lucky that we got through those bumps. But I, I think barring injury, he's only going to get better from here. I think we have a better running game than we've had in the past. Um, I, I think our front line defense is probably about on par to what it's been with the last couple of really good defenses, but the difference is it's much deeper now. And really, um, the team, the only team that scares me, and I think we all know the answer to that, the only team that scares me is Alabama, obviously. Sure. And um, I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see what they do versus LSU, and I'm going to be very interested to see how Tua holds up when he's getting hit a little bit more. I have questions about that knee. I also have questions about how the, how they will play versus teams that have a pulse in the secondary. They're, they're, everybody, everybody likes to criticize Clemson's schedule so far, but I don't think the Bama schedule has been all that great so far either. A lot of people overrate a lot of the SEC. They've got some great teams at the top. It's a fantastic conference, but there's there's a lot of soft teams in that conference that weren't as necessarily historically soft. And, and Bam has kind of been cruising through. I'm very interested in this LSU game in, in nine or ten days. I think Don't they both have a bye? They do. Well, Clemson alum 98, I certainly think that when you talk about soft teams in the SEC, that's relatively speaking. So, yes, there are some soft. There's a soft underbelly of Vanderbilt and Arkansas, maybe Ole Miss to a lesser extent. But compared to the other conferences, it's it's a pretty thin underbelly. The, the SEC is top to bottom the best conference. It, it is. It is. But, but we don't have... I don't think we have an SEC West like we had years ago. Um, Auburn, you know, I'm not impressed with Auburn. Sure. Um, I mean, Arkansas is a, Arkansas is a joke. But let's remember who that. Auburn's losing to. They're losing to other teams in the SEC. They beat Washington. When the SEC has stepped out of conference this year, they've pretty much gotten the job done across the board. They have not played a disappointing game the entire season. I am going to save Arkansas as being non-consequential. Inconsequential, what Arkansas has done. They've been embarrassing. Other than that, where the losses have been. Well, Tennessee got blown out in the second half by West Virginia, but you're taking one of the two or three best teams in the Big 12 against like the second or third or fourth worst team in the SEC. Uh, Vandy goes to Notre Dame and loses on the last possession of the game by five points with the ball down at the 20-yard line. Uh, the, you should you should know from experience taking on maybe what the fifth, sixth, seventh best team in the SEC on the road. It was a road game, but still Texas A and M playing that well against Clemson, by far the best team in the ACC. The SEC has pretty much not had uh, a down, embarrassing game outside of Arkansas. 
None. And I think that I, I, I mean, and again, I, I don't say it's a bad. I don't say it's a terrible conference, but I think it's the best conference. Bama's done. <laughs> I, I would. Well, okay, that's that's good. And and Bama's best win is against two. Of course, that's my opinion. Yeah. When I state that, I, I humbly say that's my opinion. It's the best conference. I would just love to hear the argument that it's not the best conference. Because I just well, my, uh, I'm arguing more about who Bama has played. So yes, far, well, Bama you uh, you have absolutely you've got a point there. there. Absolutely, you've got a point there because they miss three of the best teams in the conference because they're playing in the other division and they have yet to play what's most likely the two or two of the three best teams in their own division. So it's a backloaded schedule and it's not that deep. Um, so you're right. And then of course they didn't play anybody out of conference. Uh, Louisville turned out to be awful. And then they played the three scrimmage games. So I'd be interested how they, how they do against LSU, how they do against Auburn at the end. I, I, I tend not to think Auburn's going to be an issue for them this year. Yeah. I, think, I think LSU is the game to keep an eye on yep. personally. Um, so let's see how they do. Let's see how Tua holds up. Um, let's not crown them just yet. We've seen many seasons in our lifetimes where a team looks invincible and then doesn't win at all. Sure. So let's let's you know let's see him prove it. Let's see him prove it. Let's see if that knee holds up on Tua, and uh, let's see what else happens. But I think right now, um, I think Clemson is looking better, and I think Clemson has a lot more upside with the freshman quarterback that's going to continue to improve. And I think you know, we may be seeing Bama peak at the wrong time. ABC, we may see Clemson uh, continuing to improve and peak at the right time. And in college football, when you peak is very important in the span of the season. So let's see. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, I'm not sold on Notre Dame. I'm going to go on record. I'm going to go on record that Notre Dame loses at least one game, one of which will be at USC. They may. I need to look at the schedule. They may lose a random one before them. I think that one loss knocks them out. Um, if Ohio State can get it together, I think the winner of the Ohio State Michigan game will go. Sure. Um, Clemson goes. Um, and then either Bama or LSU. And then the four slot would potentially be the other if the SEC gets two or perhaps a one loss um, Big 12 champ. I think the Pac 12 is out. So that's my final four. I'll let you go. It looks like your other guest is on. Nice talking to you. And uh, I'm glad you picked Clemson. I picked Clemson. I think we know that's what's going to happen. So let's keep cheering. Yep. <laughs> Clemson alum 98. Appreciate the call, man. All right, thanks. Clemson alum 98 has commented many, 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 many dozens of times to the show and to the live chats, and we finally get him on the line. So that was good to hear from Clemson alum 98. All right, we're talking Georgia, Florida. This is what I believe to be the best game of the week. Uh, maybe it won't turn out to be the best game, but it's certainly the most important. It's certainly the most um, story traditions getting together uh, from a number of angles. The best athletes on one field probably uh, this week are Georgia, Florida. We got Savannah Lee Richardson here to talk about it. You can join Savannah on Bulldog Illustrated. Savannah, how you doing tonight? I. I'm doing pretty good. Just got back from uh, doing some player interviews. We didn't get media availability for practice today, but this, like, I'm exhausted and we haven't even gotten to the game yet. Uh, the bye week, uh, last year, I really didn't have to work much through the bye week because I hadn't taken as much responsibility as I do this year. But man, we work just as hard as if it was a game week. So I'm just like, I'm ready for the game. I mean, I've been waiting for two weeks now, writing and working and stuff. So I'm exhausted, but at the same time, really excited for this weekend. Really excited to see my first Georgia Florida game from the sidelines, I guess. Because I've so been a few Gina, times. We we've got a situation here. So you're gonna be on the sideline for the game. That that's yeah. exciting. Uh, but we've got a situation here with uh, Georgia, Florida that in the offseason, regardless of Florida having uh decent recruiting classes and a semblance of talent, uh, we thought that Dan Mullen would take a year to break in at least and that Georgia would own the division. But here we are close to game day and we've got an interesting little three team battle for the sec eastern division championship doesn't isn't this more exciting than what we expected it to be it is a lot more exciting uh the loss to lsu kind of hurt but i'd much rather have it like this because this is what makes college football so much fun to watch and so much 
fun to get into is because you don't know ever know which week you're going into whether or not you know that team's going to be able to stay in, in in the front of the line and continue doing what they've been doing every other week except for LSU or if Florida's going to come in and just take over or even if Kentucky with the dark horse kind of going in there with Benny Snell and, and really uh, gaining a lot of momentum, I'd much rather see close games than blowouts every single week. Don't get me wrong, a blowout is awesome to see because it means your offense is clicking and your defense is clicking, so that means you're doing something right. But at the same time, there's nothing like a close college football game, and I like seeing this three-team three, three team race. That means the East is, is getting better, and they're not as, you know, like – irrelevant like most people said that the east was last year so i like the competition i welcome it got uh, savannah lee richardson on the line from bulldog illustrated of course it's georgia florida and it's no longer the world's largest outdoor cocktail party why we can't say that anymore who made that decision i'm not 100 percent sh sure who made that decision but i think when they made the renovations to jacksonville stadium uh the board or whatever whoever does that make you know the plans and everything for that weekend have decided that they wanted it to be more about a family atmosphere i'm assuming instead of more about you know crazy partying and all that fun stuff but to my family it's still the world's largest outdoor cocktail party and to most of the people that i talk to they still call it that and abbreviate it throughout the week but it's been it's weird not calling it that too but it hasn't been that in a while so i don't know why everybody all of a sudden is like huh it needs to be that again but yeah Savannah, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I know it's been a while since the game was played, but it is the last game for Georgia going down to Death Valley, and it was not pretty. So there are a lot of aspects of that game that uh, I did not expect to see. I, I I picked LSU to win the game. I'm sorry, I did. Um, but I didn't expect 36-16. Now it was 19-9, to and there was uh, a spot there in the fourth quarter that uh, Georgia could have taken advantage and got back in the game, but they didn't. Um, so what most surprised you about uh, losing pretty decidedly in Baton Rouge? Um, to be honest, I want to credit the de Georgia's defense. I thought Georgia's defense and ca came out and, and played very well through the first half. And even whenever they got that break at, with halftime, they, they came out, gun, you know, got a few, I, I believe, Got to like a quick stop at the opening of the second half anyway. But when you're on the field for as long as the defense is on the field, they got gassed. They were, you know, they were tired. They just got ran down by LSU's offense, and it was just not pretty. It wasn't pretty at all. The, the offense couldn't get any kind of momentum. I think the momentum was almost sucked out of the game after the fake field goal. Don't think we ever should have done that. I also, you know, I don't think Jake Fromm ever got into a rhythm. I uh, I've, you know, been pretty quiet about the quarterback situation since the loss because I really wanted to sit back and watch film and kind of like look at both guys. And, and it's hard to do that with Fields because he hasn't gotten a lot of time. But when you're down by that much, you don't have any momentum. Why not try him? Why not use him? I mean, I understand like that's a big game. That's a big situation. You don't want to cause injury. You don't want to, you know, either even cause more turnovers or anything like that. But at the same time, Jake Fromm had nothing nothing going right for him and you could all you could see is frustration and frustration and frustration there were overthrown passes there were drop passes um but i think what really shocked me is georgia went away from the run and you know kirby we asked kirby about it and kirby's like you know we really didn't but if you go back and watch it georgia went away from the run after the the fake field goal georgia did not really go back to steadily trying to run the ball at all during the first half i think if georgia would have continued to give the ball to elijah holyfield and deandre swift i don't i don't know that georgia would have gotten beaten that bad do i think georgia would have gotten beaten yeah because lsu came in with a mentality that they were going to beat whoever they faced that day and they played lights out and they made georgia do what georgia did to opponents all last year they made georgia succumb to the physicality that LSU brought to the field. I mean, it the loss in general kind of shocked me because I expected Georgia to show up in that atmosphere. But at the same time, like we did, we went through this Auburn last year. So it's kind of like, it's not what this loss is as a loss, but it's what this team does this week, in my opinion. But it, it, it kind of stung. And, and, I mean, I'm not trying to be an advocate or anything like that. I think that the LSU atmosphere was awesome. The crowd was – that was some of the loudest I've ever been 
that is the loudest place I've probably ever been in in my entire life. But after the game, like the fans, instead of, you know, being excited and cheering, they did that. But they were also very, very rude to a lot of Georgia fans, including myself. I, I got a drink thrown on me and I even got spit on after the game, just trying to mind my own business, walking to and from the photo room. So we won't go into much of that. But after the, the before that, I had a great time. I thought that the atmosphere was great, even though Georgia lost. It was, but it kind of turned me off afterwards with LSU not being able to just kind of like win with class, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this is disturbing. So there's, there's a line there where you can go from trash talking, having fun, just, you know, regardless of who's winning the game, going back and forth, making fun of each team kind of thing. And then it goes to a level of talking about, you know, uh, being personal being very offensive with language and, and that sort of thing. Then it goes to another level when you start to get physical or you start to throw stuff at somebody. Then when you get to spitting, that's like, aside from like physical abuse. Yeah. That's about as bad as it gets. Yeah. And like, I think the worst part is, is none of the security people offered to help me afterwards or, None of the other fans, even so, like I didn't. There wasn't hardly any Georgia fans, so I'm not calling any Georgia fans or any out like that for not helping me. But you couldn't tell if I was an LSU person or a Georgia person. I didn't have any logos on. I was, you know, in my photo vest, and I guess they either recognize most of the photo the mem the media members each week or what. But the guy stopped me and grabbed me by the shoulders and said, "Thanks for taking a butt whooping." And so, I, you know, I, I put my hands up and I was like, please, you know, excuse me, I'm just trying to do my job. And then he was just like, oh, you know, cuss words and threw his drinks on my shoes. And so I pushed him back again. And I was like, please excuse me. I'm trying to go do interviews. I'm a part of media. I have to do something. And that's when he spit on my shoes again. And it was just like when I got to my boss, I was like shaking. And like it was I've never felt that uncomfortable at a college football game. And I hadn't felt, I didn't feel that until that moment. So he put his hands on you. As well. mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't like physically like grab me and shaking me. He just kind of like put his hands on my, uh, on my shoulders. Like, all right, I'm going to talk to you for a second mm -hmm. because I was coming this way and the crowd was like, everybody was coming out this way. And so I know I was going like the wrong way, but I was just trying to do my job. And it's not like he grabbed me aggressively. He just grabbed me. And then I guess I pissed him off because I didn't give him the answer that he wanted from me. So it is what it is. I'm okay now. You know, I got my shoes clean. They were my custom Nikes. That probably pissed me off more than anything is that he, he tried to ruin my shoes. But, you know, if I was a fan and he did that to me, I'm not saying that I probably wouldn't still be in LSU jail, but not going to try to be a, a BA. <laughs> well, that is, uh, it's just awful. I, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just disgusting that people go to those measures to make themselves feel better or, to make somebody else feel horrible or to, to just to stoop to that level of lack of sportsmanship is just disgusting. And I'm not trying to, you know, like complain about it or, you know, get any attention from it. I just want people to know why so many different fans don't appreciate LSU and the historic value that they're, that they're, Atmos their college atmosphere and that stadium can bring to college football. You know, if they could just win, and not do stuff like that. I mean, I've heard stories of people getting drinks thrown them in the car. You know, a guy threatening to hit a kid. I've heard all kinds of stuff. And it, I was just like, well, it's not just happening to fans. It's happening to media, too. And I've had a lot of people tell me that I should tell the people at LSU. But I'm like, it's over and done with. I just, you know, glad the that Twitter world knows it. And now you know it. So people will be more aware. Yeah, these idiots, what they need to do is actually, so they're there to watch the football game. Well, some of them are to watch the football game and to, uh, you know, they, they somewhat idolize these guys on the football field. They should actually recognize what happens after the game. When they, they're they out regardless of how hard fought the game was. Maybe some, some little scuffles broke out on the field because of the tension of the game. After the game, they should actually recognize that they're, they're shaking hands, they're hugging. They're talking to each other. They're praying with each other. All those things. And mm -hmm. make it, uh, a little bit of a cue from them. Uh, the the 18 and 19 and 20 year olds that act more adult than uh, and with better sportsmanship after the game than than they do. 
crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, it is what it is. All right. Savannah Lee Richardson from Bulldog Illustrated breaking down Georgia, Florida for us. And so Savannah, obviously um, looking at Georgia's schedule and you have heard on and on about how you don't play anyone and don't play anyone this year. And aside from the Georgia Tech game, you didn't schedule another team uh, like a Notre Dame last year. And mm -hmm. because of the West, way the SEC schedule breaks down, Auburn's late in the season and they're not even as good as they were supposed to be. Uh, the other game in the SEC West this year is, of course, who am I forgetting? LSU, obviously. So that was a difficult game. So mm -hmm. that's really being the first test. And, mm -hmm. um, and obviously not rising to the challenge of, of playing that game. So now you've got a, a second difficult opponent. Uh, do you think that the Bulldogs are going to be more ready for this one? Well, I don't want to sound like a homer and I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid about Georgia because after last week, you know, it's, you have to really sit down and question, does this offense have an identity? Because the defense is doing well enough that they can stop teams, but if the offense cannot get anything going, the defense is not going to be able to continue to stop opponents like it needs to. Georgia's defense does have injuries there. You also have a young linebacker core that does not have a lot of playtime experience. And, of course, you're losing – you lost Roquan Smith. So your defense is not necessarily going to be the same. But that they played their hearts out. And I think that they, they held their composure. They didn't get stupid penalties. And they did what they had to do because the offense could not get anything going. I think Georgia better come out gun. They got to come out aggressive. They have to come out ready because Florida saw that game last week. And Florida's probably – getting pretty confident about this game and i mean i don't honestly don't blame them i still haven't decided what i want to do my you know score prediction as but georgia's gonna have to get back to the basics run the football and um be, make them bow down to them but if they don't like it could be a, a game that comes down to the last minute field goal and I, if it does come to that I, I trust rodrigo over the florida kicker but i will say like I've, I think it's – I'm not – don't hold me to the stat correctly, but uh, Patrick Garbin, who writes for Rivals, told me the stat yesterday. I think the last six out of the seven games, the winner had been decided by who had more rushing yards and who was able to run the ball more. And I think that's going to be a huge component this weekend because both teams have workhorses, Elijah Holyfield and DeAndre Swift, and then, you know, Brian Harrion and um, James Cook. And then you also have Florida's three running backs. I can't ever – think of their I mean I know their names but I, I don't want to talk I don't want to think about it on the top of my head right now but they're just as good I had even contemplating adding one to my fantasy football lineup this week but then I was like ah loyalties but anyway Georgia's deep front seven and Florida's front seven are going to be tested Kirby keeps saying we have to build that wall through our front seven and and win the line of scrimmage and I think that's going to be Georgia Florida's ranked number 11th in the SEC in rush defenses and Georgia's eighth right now and that's not something you usually see from from the Bulldogs because what Georgia does is they pride themselves on stopping the run, and they just haven't been able to do to David losing David Marshall and a couple other guys that hadn't been able to play the last few weeks. But for sure, finding an offensive identity, figuring out whether or not you have the right quarterback in, and feeding the ball to the running backs until they're stopped. But I also think that Georgia needs to air it out some just to make that Florida secondary respect them a little bit more because Georgia has some wide receivers that can make some plays too. I feel like I haven't talked to you forever, so I keep rambling. That's okay. Keep, keep <laughs> rambling. I'm going to remind the people on the chat when I diverted to the, I was just so appalled at the incident that you faced after the game. A few people mentioned that we should get on with talking about football. Hey, Sorry, hey, everyone, calm down for just a second. You can go to all sorts of podcasts and shows and listen to these people, and they talk about pop culture and movies, and they mix in a little college football and all. We talk college football, like, on the field, like, all the time. I, we, we, This is connected to college football. It's the fan experience. It's the media experience in LSU, in Death Valley, and it's, a, unfortunately, a horrible experience and a unique one. So I wanted clarification on that. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so, what uh, most concerns you about uh, Georgia in regards to you know? Let me take it more specific than that, because Justin Fields is getting his time on the field, but in noticing when he was on the field against LSU, 
Kirby Smart doesn't want him throwing the ball when it matters. It, it just seems a bit odd that he's he's getting playing time. Fromm was struggling. He gets on the field. A few times it was fairly obvious passing situations, and and they just wouldn't throw the ball with him. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I don't – we as media, the beat members and stuff, have been trying to figure out for the last two weeks, you know, what was the mindset as to not putting Justin Fields in when Jake Fromm could not get anything going. And Kirby, you know, roundabout answers. We thought about it, but at that point, you know, like I think we were down three or four – two or three touchdowns, and so – he never really would fully answer the question at all. And so it's been more speculation and speculation and speculation. I don't, I mean, to be honest, like if I can put it simply as this, I saw a lot of weaknesses out of Jake Fromm that I did not like to see out of a sophomore quarterback against LSU. His pocket reading was, I, I mean, it was atrocious. He refused to check down. He missed Terry Godwin wide open I, two times for sure that I know, if not three times. And then, you know, he would laser eyes. Any pass he threw, it was laser to that guy. And it was half the time it was either too tall or too short to catch it. And I don't know if he was just completely off or he was just having a bad week or what. But that is something that really concerns me. And the fact that he wouldn't even give Justin Fields a chance is kind of concerning as well because it puts both Fields and Fromm in a predicament. It's just like – well, why, if you don't believe in me, then why should I continue to play football here as in fields? And then with Brom, well, I can play like crap and I'm not going to get any repercussions from it. That's how I look at it. But in my opinion, I like Fromm. I like Fromm as a quarterback. But then when you compare him to Justin Fields, Justin Fields is almost a generational type player. Jake Fromm got you to the national championship last year, but he could not capitalize and he could not essentially win. There was other elements, of course and everything else. But with Justin Fields, I think the way that he – what he brings to the game, it's almost like a Deshaun Watson type guy. He can get you to the SEC championship game. He could probably – not saying he could beat Alabama, but he has the talent to, to do that. And I think that's where the question is really going to be is, are you going to stick with your sophomore quarterback that took you to the national championship who's going through this slump, or are you going to go to this freshman guy that's hungry, ready to throw the ball, ready to get out there and prove to the world that he's, you know, another Cam Newton, another Deshaun Watson. And that's every time I hear anybody, you know, talk about him, that's all they compare him to. Well, I want to see it. We got to see it a little bit against Vandy where he had, what, two rushing touchdowns. Everybody knows his, like, he can tuck it and run, and that's where he can hurt defenses. But people also fail to realize the kid can chunk it 60, 75 yards. And they can go back and say that he overthrew two or three guys against Vandy. Well, all three of those times, the pass, you know, protection kind of collapsed on him and he had guys in his face. So he was trying to get rid of it at the same time. But also it was accurate enough. It was just kind of overthrown, if that makes sense. But going back to your question, it kind of pissed me off that he didn't give Justin Fields a chance because – he goes in there and hands it off, but then at that point in time, LSU's defense had already adjusted to stopping the run. And so when they give you that, I don't – it's just – it was frustrating game all around. And But in my opinion, heading into this weekend, I think you should utilize both quarterbacks equally. I think you give Jake Fromm a series, and I think you give Justin Fields a series until you figure out who can carry the most momentum. And if it happens to be Justin Fields, then roll with it. Jake Fromm is a, is a humble guy. He's a smart enough guy to realize I got beat. And if that's what's frustrating to see is like it's almost that the offense is comfortable with Jake Fromm and they're not quite ready to give the reins to Justin Fields. But if they continue it, one of them could be gone at the, after, the, after the season. Justin Fields could transfer because he wants playing time. Georgia, Florida, 3.30 Eastern time. From Jacksonville, of course, uh, for first place in the SEC Eastern Division, depending on what Kentucky does. So Kentucky <laughs> controls its own destiny, and and Savannah is still laughing about Kentucky, but uh, we'll see what. Oh, I'm not laughing at Kentucky. Play. I just it's still interesting that they're still in the mix. Usually by now they're like you know they fall off or they lose a few games, but they're still trucking and they're still competing every single week. I'm excited. Sure. It's my first trip to Lexington next week, and that's. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to see what Benny Snell can do because hopefully by then David Marshall will be back on that front seven. He's kind of like an unsung hero of that defensive line. Most people are like, oh, you know, like he didn't play that much. He plays a good bit, and he plugs that hole well. 
So I, I, we needed him back this week, but his ankle just wasn't happening. Well, I asked for Georgia, Florida talk on the live chat, and then people went nuts. So here we go. Here we go, Savannah. Now let's understand. I don't know how much Savannah has prepped Florida in particular, but I'll just read off the questions and I'll fill in the blanks uh, if Savannah doesn't have anything with, with the Gators. I know you've got your eye on the SEC Eastern Division, but obviously you are uh, covering Georgia football each week. So, yeah, I, um, I do a game day preview and stuff. I, I'm still working on it. So I know a little about Florida, but it's not like – if say if we had this conversation Friday, I would have be a lot more with names and everything. I'm just still getting through, uh, getting everything done. So Israel Kelly mentions that Florida doesn't have enough offense to beat Georgia. William Lee says it tells you that Fields probably isn't ready the way Kirby Smart's handling him. Uh, Sean Nicholson, who does – uh, Savannah think has the better wide receivers, Georgia, Florida, boy, I'm going to guess. Okay. Go ahead, Savannah. Well, to hit on the Justin Fields, not being ready, to be honest, how ready was Jake from last year when he had to come in when Jake, Jake, when Jacob Eason went down with an injury, I think you have to take, if he continues to have a, a sluggish start against Florida and he continues to struggle against teams, I think you have to work out the kinks with Jake, with Justin Fields. You just kind of have to, because it, if he comes in and he can score, you you need to put a, a guy out there that can score points. As for wide receivers, to be honest, Van Jefferson is one impressive guy. I remember, you know, watching earlier in the season and thinking, you know, that's Felipe Frank's favorite guy because he's he should be Felipe Frank's favorite guy. He can go up and catch the ball. He's quick. He's smart with his blocking. And he can make plays. So I get, I'm pretty sure we'll, we're going to see DeAndre Baker on Van Jefferson. And we've all, we all saw what DeAndre Baker has done all season long is, is you know, shut down top receivers for each, each, each team. However, then you look at Georgia, if I'm missing another Florida guy, I apologize. You know, I know both teams have great groups of wide receivers. You know, they've all, both groups are always, you know, talked about having great wide receivers. But I also think that Georgia has kind of an advantage. They have, you know, more veteran wide receivers. You have Terry Godwin, who is coming in, and I think this is his fourth Georgia Florida game if he's played in all four. You also have uh, Miko, is, uh, this is his second or third uh, Georgia Florida game. But, I mean, you also have Tyler Simmons, Jason Stanley. If I had to say right now, after last week's performance, I'd probably give it to Florida. But at the same time, after watching practice this week and seeing what Cortez Hankton is bringing to the table, I like how he's turning – Georgia's wide receivers and not into only like guys who can go up and catch it, but key blockers. And I think that's, like I said, it's going to be a game between, you know, the tackles running the ball. And if those wide receivers can set the edge, awesome. But I also think Terry Godwin's due for a big catch. I also think Miko Hardman's overdue for a big catch. And if we're really, does this consider tight ends too? Because if it considers tight ends, then I have to give it to Georgia because Isaac Nauta the last two weeks has done nothing but be that rock that, that Fromm needs. And he's been the one that I think he's only dropped two or three passes in the last two weeks when, because it was either uncatchable or I don't remember exactly what it was, but he needs to be included in it too, because his blocking goes into perspective and he's, he's just done a better job this, this year overall. So I don't know. I think I'm going to give it a tie. <laughs> okay. To me, wide receiver is the most difficult position if you don't have the quarterback play to evaluate. They're, they are the most dependent players on the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are completely dependent on the quarterback who's somewhat dependent on them and also somewhat dependent on the offensive line. But they are the most dependent because if the ball's not thrown at them, they are completely out of the game and not thrown well to them. Van Jefferson, the player that came in from Ole Miss where he caught 91 passes in two years for the Rebels, he leads the team with 19 catches and four touchdowns. Freddie Swain's a good player. Josh Hammond, we've seen in the program with the Gators for quite some time. Um, Tyree Cleveland's a guy that uh, makes huge plays and has in the past for Florida. He's got a couple touchdown receptions and uh, 11 catches this year. So that's kind of the Florida take. But, of course, with Felipe Franks, who's very much improving. And I'll let everyone know that we've got David Waters lined up from Gators Breakdown tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. So 8 o'clock Eastern time. Thursday night, David Waters with the Florida side of the big game against uh, Georgia. All right, let's see what else we've got for questions. There's about 20 of them lined up here. So I don't know how much time you have, Savannah. Let's see what we've got here. To be honest, I have as here. long as you need me to. <laughs> Reloading here uh, as I went to the Florida stat page. Oh, boy, where are we? I've lost track. 
since I asked the question about, let's see. Okay, here we go. We've got, um, so we've got a comparison between, you saw LSU secondary, of course, uh, featuring Greedy Williams, Christian Fulton at the corners of five star Greedy's ready to play in the NFL like tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, comparing the LSU secondary based on what you see out of Florida. These are traditionally two of the great uh, programs in producing uh, defensive backs. Oh, for, I mean, they're, they self-proclaim, you know, DBU at, at Florida. And yeah, I have, you have to give them credit because I don't think if I'm not a hundred percent sure on the stats, but I don't think they've given up one passing touchdown this year. Is that correct? I'd have to look it up, but um, yeah, they've done a great job at shutting down uh, wide receivers and being in cover. They, they just they do a good job. They're ranked number one in the SEC in, in pass defense, and you got to give them credit. They have some veteran guys back there. They're strong, and probably two or three of them could be playing in the NFL too, but you also have to give credit to Georgia's secondary as well because they're sitting right there at number three in pass defense behind Mississippi State and Florida. And they're doing just as good of a job. I thought, you know, we saw last – two weeks ago with LSU and Georgia, we saw two of the best corners in the country with Greedy Williams and DeAndre Baker. And I have – you know, Florida's going to have guys up there as well. But I also think Florida hasn't really been tested through the air either, if that makes sense. Because I think most people know that they can beat them on the ground. That's how Kentucky beat them. And I think that's what LSU could have done. But I think they also – did not I, I'm trying to remember that game, but at the same time it's kind of like uh, I can't remember that. <laughs> well, but that I think we're gonna see that. so LSU came out and they scored on the opening drive. They took it right down the field and scored seven to nothing. And the rest of the first half was basically a situation in which LSU could have could have gained on that lead, but they kept blowing chances and kept Florida in the game. And then uh, Florida took off in the second half. Dan Mullen called a couple trick plays that worked. Uh, they had a pick six late in the game that wrapped it up when uh, Burrow had the ball in his hand down 20 to 19, only needed a field goal. They were deep in their own end, so he did have to drive the ball uh, 40 or 50, 60 yards, something in that range to get in field goal range. So they were pinned deep. He threw the pick six on an out route on the right sideline, and uh, that ended the game uh, for the Gators right there. Uh, your thought about uh, where Georgia might have the best advantage based on your best positional unit maybe taking advantage of Florida? I think our offensive line and our running backs are two positions that Georgia is stacked in. I have to give credit to Elijah Holyfield because I even came on here and didn't give him any credit at all. Somebody and mentioned that in the live chat, actually. Uh, you gave him no credit, didn't put any faith or trust in him. And I will eat crow and, you know, I, I, I'll eat crow happily because the kid has done nothing but improve and he's running with a purpose. Seven and a half yards of carry averaging right now and leads the team in rushing and the kid is hungry for more. He's, ex he's fun to talk to. He's, uh, he's excited to be able to get this playing time. And I think he continues to improve each week. Like I said before, he catches a hundred balls after practice every day to work, to work on catching passes out of the, out of the backfield. The kid just doesn't stop working. He wants to impress, and he wants to really just show how much he wants to be in that spot. And I never gave him credit, and so I'm, you know, coming on record and being like, I'm giving the kid credit now for sure. But then you also have Georgia's offensive line, which most people may be like, ah, without Ben Cleveland, no way. They have a true freshman in at right guard who is doing just as good of a job I'm not going to say it better because Ben Cleveland has, is a huge plug right there and, and does a great job. But Cade Mays has done phenomenal for being a true freshman coming in, having to play in LSU and having to do and just kind of being flung out there and asked to play in. You know, he's played left tackle, he's played right guard, and then outside of them, Georgia's line's so young. But it comes down to how the center. And the health center is, and I have to give Lamont Gilliard credit. He has improved in the last two years, and I think he is the heart and soul of this offensive line. He's really taken into his leadership role, and um, I just I I'm, like as a whole, Georgia's offensive line has done a great job at opening holes for the running backs and even even protecting Jake Fromm. Because when Jake Fromm got sacked two weeks ago, it wasn't because Georgia got beat on 
you know, pass protection. It was because Georgia had held for as long as they possibly could the pocket. It was just time for Trump to get rid of it. And he didn't know he never got rid of it. So offensive line and running backs for sure. <laughs> Uh, people on the live chat would like a prediction. What we're going to do there is send you to Bulldog Illustrated. You will have a prediction there, right, Savannah? Yeah, I'll, um, I do. We do staff predictions on Saturday morning, and then I have my game day preview on Saturday morning where you can find out my three things Georgia has to do for a win, and then I include a um, prediction at the end of it. I will say I think Georgia will pull it out in the end, but I just haven't decided – how close it should be. I think Florida's going to give them everything they got, but I think Georgia's just got the upper hand because they're pissed off. They just, they lost to LSU on that big of a stage. And I think it's, it's kind of like a no prisoners or not, you know, kind of mentality. So there's a ton of comments and questions on the live chat, but we're going to cut it a little bit short. I want to, I want to clarify one point that Savannah made. So I want to get this straight Savannah. If you were running the show, if you were Kirby smart, would you bench from or you would just get Justin Fields more playing time? Well, <laughs> I haven't been asked this question yet, or I've kind of tried to avoid That's this. That's why I'm here. But um, in a sense, I would let Jake Fromm come out there because he has he has proved his point. He's earned his right to be where he is. And if he continues to struggle and if he can, continues to make bad decisions, then yeah. But like I said earlier in the segment, I think we should – See, we should give him two or three series against Florida, if not more. I think even kind of like what Florida used to do with Chris Leak and Tim Tebow until Tim Tebow was absolutely ready to take the reins and take over that starting position. I know Chris Leak was closer to graduation than it is with Jake. But at the same time, if Justin Fields is the better option and he can go out there and he can, can, he can build momentum and he can build drives and get the team into the end zone, while Jake Fromm is sitting there getting three and outs, it's kind of like an easy done deal. Not necessarily, you know, benching him right away, but giving the freshman a chance to kind of work through everything and if he can do it, then yeah. But it's, he keep, Kirby keeps saying, we're going to put the best guy out there that's going to make us win. Well, he didn't do that against LSU. And I'm a big Kirby supporter, and, you know, I usually – whatever Kirby says, it's kind of like, okay, we're going to go with what Kirby says. But after last weekend and rewatching the film and stuff, he didn't make the right decision when it came to taking Justin – putting Justin Fields in for an extended period of time. So, in a sense, yeah, I want to give Justin Fields a shot. But at the same time, you have to also respect where Jake Fromm is coming from and how hard he's worked as well. So – Savannah Lee Richardson on the line, breaking down Georgia, Florida for us. You can catch her coverage and the rest of the group there at uh, Bulldog Illustrated. Uh, Savannah, we could talk Georgia football all night, get us set for the Gators and the Bulldogs, but we need to uh, move the talk to the best team in the SEC Eastern Division. You just you were just talking to us. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, we've we were got some sitting, Kentucky well, I, talk coming up with uh, Kevin McGuffey, so I, I thought we would go to the class of the SEC East what we would do yeah i mean kentucky's fun to watch so have fun. i mean wait <laughs> how how long is it till basketball se- i gotta throw a little dig out there how long is it till basketball season it's uh, they'll start watching uh maybe i think the sec play at least kicks in after the national championship game so kentucky wins the national championship in football then uh, <laughs> the sec schedule starts after that hey when pigs well you never know Okay, I mean, just it, like with the Purdue, comment was flying there. Just like with Purdue and Ohio State, any given day, Kentucky can put it together. And Absolutely. We it. saw what happened there. And uh, I will make this statement. I don't necessarily think Kentucky's the best team in the division, but for right now, they have the best resume in the yes. division. I can agree with that for sure. Okay. All right, Savannah, thanks so much. Enjoy the game. And uh, stay out of the way of those um, morons that you run into at these games. My goodness, <laughs> awful! I will. I'm gonna keep it keep it together this weekend. All right, Savannah. Not anybody. Have a good night. Thanks. Thanks, Savannah. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, Georgia, Florida should be a fun one. Three thirty Eastern time, and uh, uh, had a few people uh, mentioning that uh, possibly we could do a watch party here at Mark Rogers TV. So to be announced. Also in this triumvirate of a SEC Eastern Division race would be the Kentucky Wildcats with a trip to Mizzou to take on Drew Locke and company. 
Kevin McGuffey joins us uh, with his blue on representing the cats and joining us from last word on college football. There it is. Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing good. That was, that was quite the, uh, quite the intro. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to jump in or, um, or what there. <laughs> well, I, I took a lot of, uh, fun in just seeing Savannah's response when I mentioned that uh, we were now needing to move it on to the best team in the SEC East. Oh, I thought, I thought it was great. And, uh, I don't know. I guess maybe Savannah and I will have to maybe chat next week, depending on how uh, depending on how things go, because it's certainly going to be an, an interesting weekend. Um, Kentucky's by, by the way, Kentucky's basketball season starts November sixth, um, and they they start with Duke in the uh, Champions Classic, um, right. playing in um, playing in um, Indianapolis, and then as you said, the uh, I think that the conference play starts somewhere around. Um, the first of January. So, but anyway, but Hey, like you, you and I have talked before it's, it's the middle of October and we're not talking and we're not talking about basketball, you know, a hundred percent in Langston. There's a lot of people talking football and with good reason. We're talking about the fifth ranked team in the country. And if, if folks out there are a bit confused, I'm talking about the Mark Rogers TV rankings, the top 25, I've got Kentucky at number five. That's based on a resume I don't believe that they're the fifth best team in the country, but hey, I believe that that resume is really good right now. The lone loss in overtime at Texas A&M, the same place that uh, Clemson went and barely survived on a failed two-point conversion. So the Kentucky resume right now is rock solid. They have cleared the one hurdle of Florida. They will have the next one against Georgia if you look at those three. But we know college football, you can't look past anyone, especially when you've got a future NFL quarterback, Kevin, uh, on the other side of the field uh, coming up Saturday. Oh, you're exactly right. Um, like I said, as far as resume, you know, Kentucky, you know, beat Florida first time in 31 years, you know, with each with each successive week, that win looks better and better. Um, you know, they knocked off, you know, Mississippi State, uh, a team that a lot of people thought Kentucky was going to lose that game and then, you know, beat South Carolina for a uh, a fifth year in a row. So, um, you know, it, it's right now it's, it's interesting. Kentucky has um, a winning streak against everyone in the SEC East except for Georgia. And that's I can't remember that ever, you know, maybe in the seventies that I can never remember that happening, but yes, look, looking at Saturday, I mean, the, the, you know, one of the things is to look for is going to be the, you know, the matchup of Drew Locke versus the, um, versus the Kentucky secondary, um, you know, with, you know, Derek Beatty and Darius West and Mike Edwards and those guys, you know, in the, in the past, Kentucky has been susceptible to the long, you know, to the long ball. And that's one of, you know, Locke's specialties. And, you know, they've done a great job against that this year. You know, right now, Kentucky leads, you know, the SEC in defense, you know, in points. They're giving up, you know, 12 points a game, which is just, you know, an amazing stat. You know, Matt, Matt House and that group have just done an incredible job. And it's been, you know, and quite frankly, they've been, you know, winning some of these games recently with defense. So it is a legitimate stat. So at this point, certainly what might be the best offense that Kentucky will face has yet to, to be played the game against. Georgia. But other than that, uh, you did not get a light touch in the SEC Western Division. You had to take on Mississippi State and on the road at Texas A&M. Uh, if I remember correctly, I'm trying to think the Texas A&M score was something in the like 23-17 range, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 20, uh, 2014. 2014, they lost in that. The 14 points in regulation. Yeah, yeah, it was 20. <clears throat> yeah, excuse me, it was 2014 in, in overtime. You know, A&M won that game, but... Um, Sure. But yeah, and, they, and as you said, you know, anything offensively, but they only scored seven on the opening drive of that game. South Carolina, ten points. Florida, sixteen points. It's just been a consistent defensive effort each and every week. Uh, it will be fascinating to see um, the next two weeks because it's again the most talented offense, top to bottom offensive line, running backs, everybody considered. Next week against Georgia, this week it's most likely the best quarterback or the most NFL ready quarterback with a lot of weapons on the outside. But maybe Kentucky control the line of scrimmage and make it very difficult for Drew Lock because even Tom Brady can't uh, throw too many touchdown passes on his backside. So that's a big key to the game, of course. Right, yeah, and um, like I said, the, the um, you know Josh Allen and um, you know Jordan Jones and those guys, whether if they can get if they can get to lock and disrupt him, that that's going to be one of the biggest uh, biggest keys to the game. But uh, something I want to talk about, um, Coach Stoops kind of threw everybody 
for a bit of a loop earlier this week um, on his um, his weekly radio show. He said that um, basically implied that um, not only would Terry Wilson play, but they may play three different quarterbacks against Missouri this week. Said that um, you know they're going to start with Wilson and see how it goes, but you know they expect to possibly play Gunnar Hoke and maybe even Danny Clark. So um, whether that you know turns out to be fruition comes to fruition, or whether it's just you know coach speak to try to get Wilson motivated. But you know as you said, you know basically the Kentucky offense the last three games has pretty much been you know Benny Snell. And granted, Terry Wilson has done some great things running the ball. He ran for almost 100 yards against Vandy, and so. You know, now everybody here, you know, in Big Blue Nation is kind of like, okay, what do we, you know, uh, ro- roll on the dice here if, um, you know, trying to get that passing game going because, you know, Kentucky, you know, they threw for 18 yards against um, against Vandy. You know, Wilson was three for nine. He did have one short touchdown to Lynn Bowden. But if you look at the, at this, at the ratings, you know, Kentucky's, I think, 100 and, 123rd in, in college football in passing yards per game basically only ahead of like the military schools and Georgia tech, you know, the teams that never, you know, that never run the ball. Fascinating. Yeah. But then of course, when you have somebody like Benny Snell and, you know, in the backfield, you know, he can, he can make up for a lot of deficiencies. So anyway, like I said, it's going to be very interesting to see you know, they said they're going to start Wilson and they're going to see how it goes. They actually, uh, Eddie Grant, the offensive coordinator actually said they had planned on doing something like this against Vanderbilt, but Kentucky went, uh, fumble, fumble, their first two possessions, and then um, just kind of the offense just kind of went downhill, and they just decided to kind of pack it in and 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 give an extra dose of Benny Snell, and then um, so that didn't happen. But like I said, just, he said that on Monday. He kind of talked about it Monday afternoon, and then Monday night he said, "Yeah, we're we're gonna basically we're gonna have all three guys ready, and we'll we'll see what happens." So it was a uh, it was very interesting, especially at this point in you know this point in the season. You know they're six and one. You know, do you, you know, do you rock the boat here? You know, have what, you know, whatever cliche you want to use. But um, it, it, like I said, it, it just adds another wrinkle to this to this game on Saturday. All right, we got Kevin McGuffey on the line from Last Word on College Football, breaking down the surprising Kentucky Wildcats uh, coming off a fourteen to seven win against Vanderbilt. And um, if I could forecast every game like this one that they played against Vandy at home. Um, I certainly would do so because uh, I got to say I was right on the money on this one. Just thinking, I didn't necessarily think they would only score 21 points between them, but I, I wasn't too far off thinking I was. I didn't have to think twice that okay, Kentucky's going to win this game. That's where my resources go. If you follow me toward the Kentucky side, but I also 13 points. I'm taking Vandy on that side as well. I I just envisioned this kind of game. And uh, Kevin, you know what a nut I am when it comes to college football, as we all are, that do this here. Uh, I try to get to as many box scores and recaps uh, around FBS football late, late, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night. I did not get to this game. And to see after you spit out the stats on Terry Wilson's uh, line. So we're talking about a seven and one team in the SEC uh, in 2018. And he went three for nine with 18 yards passing. I, I just think that's beautiful. There, There's yeah. uh, something great about that. And knowing that Benny Snell is running at you 32 times and Kentucky continues to win these games. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. Now, And I will say this, that the game Saturday night was played in a massive, you know, windstorm. There was like 40 to 50 mile an hour winds, which, you know, even, you know, Kyle Shermer, he didn't have, I think he ended up up with around 180 or something yards passing. 16. Yeah, he didn't have as as good a game as you know as he's had against Kentucky in the past. But you know, I you can you know you can't really blame the elements for everything. So, but as you said, basically, if you go back to the, the honestly the second half of the South Carolina game, I think Kentucky's only scored three three offensive touchdowns in the last uh, two and a half games. Um, you know, they didn't score at all in the second half against South Carolina, had the one touchdown against AM, and then the two, the one offensive touchdown and the two touchdowns against Vandy. So I said, they're just, you know, it, it, I said, it, it's, it's, it's a, the old riverboat gambler, I guess, kind of thing. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But as you said, you know, Benny Snell ran for 192, excuse me, 169 yards. And then Wilson ran for, you know, 91 on his own. So, 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, it said that they're, like I said, they're ranked basically right above the military schools. I think it's the military schools, Georgia Tech and Georgia Southern, I believe, are in, in passing yards right now, are the only teams that they're ahead of. So, you know, like I said, it's in this day and time, you know, when everyone is so pass happy, everyone, you know, the the spread offenses, the, you know, the crazy formations, you know, to, to have to be six and one with, with this basically kind of a one dimensional offense is pretty amazing. We've got Kentucky traveling to Missouri. It's a game on the SEC Network at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Of course, 3 o'clock Central time in Columbia. I could see a game that could play out in Kentucky's favor in which Drew Locke throws for his typical 300, 350. Uh, They only run for about 60. And then Kentucky counters with 75 or 80 yards passing, maybe 100. And then uh, Benny Snell gets his uh, 150 to 175. They get a couple turnovers. They play the great red zone defense. And there you go. It's going to be, you know, 23 to 17 Kentucky. That kind of. Okay. I, I, I like that. Um, I, you know, I, I think Kentucky's got to score more than that. Yeah. Um, just, just, just my opinion, just because of how good now, you know, Locke has struggled. If you look at the stats, he struggled somewhat in the SEC you know, they are 0 and 3 in the conference. And, but of course, you know, two of those losses were Alabama and Georgia. And then the other loss was, you know, in a monsoon, you know, at South Carolina. But, you know, I just, you know, he had a really good game against Kentucky last year, you know, one that, you know, Kentucky built up a big lead and then had to hold off, hold off the Tigers. You know, I'm thinking Kentucky's got to score 27, 27, 28 points. You know, I think Kentucky's going to win a close game. Um, we'll, you know, we'll see about, you know, we'll see. I, I think they've got to score more than, you know, obviously they got to score more than 14 points. You're not going to beat Missouri scoring 14 points. I love this. Kentucky is in the thick of the SEC Eastern Division race. They've already beaten South Carolina. They beat uh, Florida, of course, uh, breaking that long, long losing streak going back to 1984. They beat a favored Texas or a Mississippi State team. They only have one loss, and it's in overtime against the team that is only lost to Alabama and to Clemson by two points. This is legit. It may not be pretty. It may not be what we typically see in 2018 when we look across college football and see the likes of uh, teams in the Big 12 and the Pac-12 in particular throwing the ball all over the field, but it's working. And sure, would they ideally want to throw the ball a little bit better? I, I think ideally this is a team. Let's say they complete this miracle run, Kevin. They get to the SEC championship game. This is a team that would like to get more of like a 10 out of 15, 13 out of 20 effort from Terry Wilson for 125 to 50 yards and not make any mistakes and hit the big plays when they need to in the passing game. Obviously, Snell runs it for 150 or 160, and that's more the formula. Yeah, no, you're you're exactly right. And you go back to, you know, like the Florida win, you know, that was probably the best game that Wilson had. I think he threw for somewhere around 150, 160 yards and, um, you know, with the two touchdowns. And like I said, I I mean, I don't know if it's a confidence thing or if it's, um, you know, the the coaches, nobody, you know, he he says he feels fine. He's just like overthinking things. He just needs to go out and just, you know, and and just play play his game. And as you said, it would be, you know, a win Saturday, um, like I said, sets up, you know, in my opinion, it's at least it would be the biggest game in Kentucky football since 2007. You know, there are some that, you know, want to go back all the way to the 70s um, when Kentucky, I think, like 1977. There's like three years in Kentucky football that you always, you know, as I've been doing my columns for last work on last word. Yeah, nice. I got the name wrong. Last word, not work. Last word on college football. You know, there's three three years that I always keep coming up with Kentucky football. It's 1977, 1984, and then 2007. And um, you know, there are people that have been around the program for years and years. You know, say that the game next week could be the biggest game. I think Kentucky beat Penn State in 1977 when they were ranked in the top five. And up until that point, it was probably one of the biggest wins in school history. Um, you know that that it's that kind of it's that kind of game. Like I said, we don't want to get don't want to get that you know that that far ahead yet. But like I said, I, I think Kentucky wins a close game. Um, I think it's going to be a very very entertaining game. And um, you know, like I said, you know, after after Georgia, you go you go to Tennessee. Who you know, Kentucky should win that one. But you know, Tennessee's gotten better. You know, if if Kentucky had played Tennessee a month ago, I would say Kentucky wins like three touchdowns. But you know. You, you can see, you know, 
going against Alabama obviously was a, a bit of a setback last week, but you can see they're a lot better. And then after that, you have uh, Middle Tennessee, which is a game they should win. And then Louisville, um, even though it's at Louisville, you know, they're kind of, uh, they've been kind of a disaster this year. So, um, you know, like I said, 10 and, you know, 10, the, you know, 10 and two would be amazing. You know, right now, the last time Kentucky won eight wins, won eight games in a regular season was 1984. So, and if they beat Missouri on Saturday, see, like I said, it's these two years, it'll be the first time they finished above 500 in the SEC since 1977. So, you know, it's just some amazing, you know, amazing things that like people around the program have just never, you know, never seen. Like, you know, for an example, I think, I, you know, 1977, I was seven. So, you know, I kind of remember, you know, a little bit, you know, back then, but not, um, you know, not like, you know, not like it is today where every game is on TV. Every game is, you know, you have, you know, Facebook and Twitter and everything like that. So, but, I mean, 11, an 11-1 11 and Kentucky team going to Atlanta playing – um playing Alabama would just be, you know, just, it, it, it's kind of unfathomable, but it's, you know, it, it, it's a possibility. We'll just, you know, coach beat, take it one game at a time. So let's consider this as we stand right now, Kentucky actually has the advantage over the other two teams that they're competing against. Georgia has yet to play either one Kentucky or Florida. And of course, Kentucky won the game against Florida. So we've got a round Robin working between the three and Kentucky has played the one game out of the three and won it. Uh, so they have the one win that's key in this triumvirate of sorts. And uh, don't ask me, unless you know, Kevin, what would happen if, let's say, Florida beat Georgia, then Georgia beat Kentucky, and they all finish with one loss, uh, 11 and one and seven and one in the SEC. I, I don't know what the tiebreaker would be. I would yeah. think since they all beat each other, it would come down to some kind of point differential. Yeah, maybe I don't know that if it's wouldn't... point differential, if it's like rankings, if it's um, I, I haven't not. I haven't got that far, rankings. but uh, we'll 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 see. You know, maybe after maybe after this week, depending on what happens with Florida and Georgia, we might I might start investigating that a little further. Honestly, I honestly don't know. I mean, I don't know if it would be better record against. I said because they would all be tied. I don't know how that would. You'd all be tied. You would have a common opponents uh, that would factor in if two teams played the same team in the SEC West, but I wouldn't think that that would be fair. That would be kind of an odd oddity to, to tack that on. Uh, Kentucky, of course, played Mississippi State and Texas A&M. Florida plays Mississippi State, uh, which they lost to Mississippi State, so that would work in your favor. Um, and, uh, of course, Florida also plays LSU. They won that game and then Georgia and Florida would have the overlap of LSU and yeah, we're, we're just yeah, going nuts here. So it, it's interesting to think about, uh, because as you well know, this college football playoff talk typically centers around about five teams and with Ohio state and some other teams going down it expands a little bit, but still they can't quite reach to Kentucky yet. Uh, even though Georgia has the same exact record and plays in the same division. And if anything, as we just mentioned, Kentucky has the leg up at, at least at this point that, uh, yeah, these guys just can't bring themselves to bring Kentucky into the college football playoff talk. But I, I'm sure, and I know you, Kevin, you're not worried about that. Let's win the next game. That'll take care of itself if we're fortunate enough to get there. Otherwise, I'll enjoy nine and three or 10 and two. Oh yeah, I mean, would Kentucky fans would be thrilled to death with the nine and three, you know, nine and three record going. Probably, you know, if they finish nine and three, they're probably going to go to the Outback Bowl. Um, you know, ten and two. You know, there's been, you know, the game last the, the game last Saturday. I think there was representatives from the Sugar. I think the Sugar and Peach Bowl were there. You know, last week. You know, the Peach Bowl has been one that's been has come up in conversations a lot. So like the Outback and the Citrus and. Um, Basically, the Outback and the Citrus are the two main ones that have come up. And then, like I said, you know, getting getting really crazy, you know, the Sugar Bowl or the you know the Peach Bowl. I think the Peach Bowl might be more would be more of a, a get than maybe the Sugar Bowl. I could see LSU maybe, you know, ending up there if they don't. I don't think they're going to end up. You know, they're not going to end up in the playoff. Obviously, I don't think. But um, but anyway, but, you know, that that game that's to be determined next week too. So. All right, Kevin McGuffey from Last Word on College Football breaking down Vandy or no? Vandy was the victim last week, of course. It's a trip to Missouri for Kentucky yeah. at six and one, four and one in the SEC, taking on Drew Locke and company 
uh, off to a bad SEC start at 0-3. Kevin, we appreciate you stopping by. Maybe we can catch up on Saturday, hopefully after another big UK win, and then on to Georgia. Uh, that sounds good, Mark. I always look forward to talking to you, and I really appreciate it. And uh, everybody, ha have a good evening, and uh, go cat. <laughs> All right. We're here at the uh, live chat to uh, what many have considered to be the best live chat in college football. So I have asked you guys to give yourselves a name. So if you'd like to do that, certainly we can have some fun with that. And maybe we'll have a an actual live chat talking about the live chat and you guys naming yourselves. Because as Navy Thomas, I believe, first and foremost was the first one to state best live chat in college football. Then from there, I said, hey, you guys need to give yourselves a name. I'm available at 860-325-3687. That's 860-325-3687. And we'll remind you again that at 8 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow night, we've got uh, David Waters on the line from Gators Breakdown. So we'll get the Georgia side or the Florida side of the Georgia-Florida big game on Saturday. Also, I will consider a Florida, Georgia watch party. And I will announce that uh, I don't see anything really standing in the way. Why don't we get that on at three 30 Eastern time on Saturday, a Georgia, Florida watch party. So I will announce that for sure uh, in the coming days. Uh, I've got predictions and previews available at SG one sports, Wisconsin Northwestern's coming up. I've got Purdue and a Michigan state available and another big 10 matchup in the Western division with Iowa traveling to Penn State. So catch my previews and predictions of Big Ten football at SG1 Sports. Also, my discussions with Steve Merrill from Pro Sports Info. All right, I will take a phone call or two at 860-325-3687. Otherwise, I think it's pizza in the World Series, and it's uh, editing some of these segments to get them out for you right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and over at SG1 Sports where we have a live stream. So everybody on the live stream right now, uh, keep in mind that at SG1 Sports, I've been asked to do live streams there and I've done one and will continue to do them Friday at noon Eastern time, Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, live streams over at uh, SG1 Sports. And as soon as I thought I had the rest of the night off, boom, somebody calls, but that's a good thing. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Oh, maybe I am off the hook. I, I will hang around for just a second because I hate to miss a phone call. 860-325-3687. Just in case somebody had uh, called the line and hung up uh, accidentally. All right. Uh, so again, just to recap, we have a ton of uh, videos available here. And three Big Ten previews and predictions over at SD1 Sports with Iowa, Penn State, Purdue, Michigan State, and Wisconsin Northwestern. Also, betting lines um, for week nine. We discussed that with Steve Merrill here and also with his top three picks of the week for the top three games and a sleeper pick over at SD1 Sports. Again, the live stream right here tomorrow night with David Waters of Gators Breakdown at 8 o'clock Eastern time. And I really have yet to decide, but I've got a conversation coming up at 11 Eastern time in two hours with Chris Fetters of UW Pound talking Washington football. I don't know if I should do that private and then just release the video or if you guys want to jump on the live stream, I don't know which I'm going to do. Most likely we'll just uh, knock that out, preview the Washington game coming up this week. But I'll be back here tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern time with David Waters from Gators Breakdown. And, of course, we want to preview as much as we possibly can for Week 9 with Miami and Boston College. So stick around and stay tuned for what I'll announce for previews, post-game, Miami-Boston College, blow that out. We will certainly on Friday night. UCLA is also in action as well against Utah. Appreciate you guys stopping by. Like comment, subscribe. Please do that. It uh, certainly drives this channel. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and we will get three in there. See you next time.